For the purposes of the Mises Home Study course, today we'll be discussing consumer protection with Robert Murphy, professor at uh, Hillsdale College, who knows, um, who's, who's going to be discussing the economics, politics, some historical aspects of consumer protection. And I'm Jeff Tucker, um, general editor at the Mises Institute. I'm going to start, start by asking Professor Murphy, uh, what is, is there a generally accepted definition or understanding of what constitutes consumer protection, so that when we talk about consumer protection, what are we talking about? Um, I'm not sure that I would say there's a, a generally accepted definition um, that you would see in a textbook per se, but I, the sort of thing that we're going to be talking about today is um, measures that the government takes, if, if it's in terms of government efforts at consumer protection, to ensure um, the safety or quality of, of goods that can, and services that consumers get. And so just you need to distinguish it so it's not the same thing, for example, as workplace safety. All right, so those are different fields. And we have in mind things um, so when you go to the store and buy a product that you have some degree of assurance that there, it's not poisonous or that if it is, it's clearly labeled. So examples of things would be government um, measures that require firms to label their products and that if you buy something, you, you go to a restaurant and you get food poisoning that the government has – laws in place so that you can go sue the relevant firm because the the uh, the idea is the standard idea that oh if it if it weren't for these measures then you know the free market would just have businesses out there wouldn't you'd have adulterated products and and people would be you know dying in the streets after they come out of the restaurant and there'd be no recourse if were it not for these um consumer protection measures so we are talking about the retail sector yeah i would think so well you retail yeah, that's that's what I have in mind by that. Yes. Um, there's there's several um, aspects to this, and so let me just um, start out initially just to give some idea of what the 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 free marketeer could say in terms of mechanisms that the free market has to ensure um, consumer protection. And so here, of course, we mean in the in the generic sense, not in the sense of things provided by the government, so just to show that the government doesn't need to provide so-called consumer protection measures. And I'll, I'll try to rank them in order of things that more a greater number of people would agree with. And then as I get further in the list, it'll get um, things that are perhaps uh, more subtle, but that I think if we think about them, that really the free market could provide these things. So first and foremost, that I think everyone can understand is um, if – the, the primary mechanism is that if you were selling an adulterated product or something that killed your customers, you would lose sales. So right there, that's an obvious mechanism that's in place. And this is the one that even people hostile to the market would, would concede, and they, that's the caricature. They think, yeah, that's the, the one thing that, that the free market would do to protect consumers is that businessmen know, well, if we kill our customers, they won't come back. And, and I, I recall when I um, wrote – Something to when I was a, when I was younger and wrote something for the uh, my local newspaper on this on the it, there was had just been a a value jet crash in the Everglades and so there were all these calls for um you know we, we need to beef up funding for the FAA and look at this is what the what the free market gets you and I remember it was in response to my, my letter to the editor which they actually allowed me to to write a, a bigger piece was in response to there were claims people saying um, op ed writers things like. Um, you know, libertarians clamor for the free market, but after the this crash in the Everglades, you know, the rest of us are want the government inspectors to work overtime, right? So that's the the popular idea here that whenever anything bad happens, that it just shows. Look at that's what the market gives you, and anything good is, of course, because of the government regulations that are in place. Um, but anyway, just to I'll come back to that later, but to, to just uh, finish out the train of thought. So the in response to that particular letter that I wrote or that piece that I wrote for my paper, someone wrote a letter to the editor in response to that and said something like, yeah, in one sense, Mr. Murphy is right that um, if, if ValueJet keeps killing its customers, it's eventually going to go out of business. And that was supposed to be the ultimate put down. But that that's, I think, a very valid argument that, of course, businesses aren't going to um, continually you know, sell products that are going to uh, endanger the lives of their customers. And what goes along with that, the way businesses try to capture the benefits of that is, of course, name, name brands. And so it's true that fly-by-night organizations or companies, it's possible you could come up with scenarios where if there's no other ramifications, they might make more money 
by selling some type of product that you know promises to cure cancer, but really it's snake oil, and and that you know oh the free market alone, what sort of incentives are in place to to punish that sort of activity, and and perhaps so. And later on, we'll talk about more subtle mechanisms that might address that sort of concern. But of course, clearly these huge corporations like Bayer is not going to make money by instead of selling legitimate aspirin by selling placebos okay or selling something that's downright harmful to their customers they're just that would be a stupid business move even without any issue of morality involved and so that's and and the same thing with child safety caps and things like that that people think oh if it weren't for the government you know all these toddlers would be choking to death because there'd be no child safety caps And, and again that's uh, that's not necessarily true to the extent that that stuff really is justified and is good for consumers. Why would we think that companies would overlook that? And again, particularly uh, huge companies with name brand recognition. And there are examples where companies do you know, have massive uh, recalls of products that have been found to be unsafe where they take them off the market and try to you know, contact people who have registered and, and get them back. And of course, the critic's going to say, oh, that's only because of the government measures, but Again, to the extent that you want to have continuing business with, with particular customers, I think that those sorts of things are in place, and that would happen even if it weren't out of fear of government-sponsored sp- uh, lawsuits. I should uh, just mention here, in the, the few cases I know about, it's usually the industry that alerts the government and not right. vice versa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, to people like you and me, where we have a general, you know, we're friendly towards voluntary activities, that just seems like, yeah, that's the free market in action. But, of course, the critics are going to say, oh, it's only because the government's got that club and that if, if they didn't do that. But so, as I say, as we move on, we'll try to see why I think our, our response to that is the, is the right one, our interpretation of how to look at those. Um, the other, an, another major category, I think, is the function of intermediaries or what's commonly called middlemen. And this is something, too, it's just common sense and we see it every day and yet if you think about it it really is an example of how the market automatically um, allows experts to weed out bad products from good products so just a few examples something like walmart where they're the ones going around and dealing with all of the thousands or maybe even tens of thousands of producers and that you the retailer you don't need to investigate the origins of each and every product you buy you just go to walmart and if if something makes your kids sick or you, know, you you buy pork chops from Walmart and you go home and your family's thrown up all night, you go and you complain to Walmart. And whether or not there's a legal um, right that they have or that you have a legal, uh, legal action against them, certainly to keep you happy, they're going to want to minimize that sort of activity. And so when they go out and buy meat from the butchers and whoever, the, um, the meatpacking plants, they're going to have their own experts analyzing it and they're going to you know, send inspectors to these places and say, are you, are you, are you uh, using processes that would ensure that your product is, is a good one? All right. So it's this idea that, that some people have, depending on how naive they are, that it's really the consumers against everybody else is, of course, wrong. That in that case, Walmart, in a sense, is the one buying it. And this gets back to what you were talking about in the beginning, that, that yes, consumer protection, I think, in the popular usage refers just to the retailer. But, of course, there are huge businesses that are in the chain of purchasing, and they're, it's in their interest, too, to make sure the product is safe. And just some other examples, uh, a legal firm, you know, a big law firm, and of course that's also not something that the average person thinks is, is on their side, but you're not, the average person, of course, doesn't need to be an expert in law to hire an attorney. And again, what one of the major mechanisms for ensuring that sort of name brand recognition is you go to a big law firm, and you don't need to know the particular attorney that you get assigned, what, what's his track record, or let me go see where he got his degree from and how do you do on the bar. You don't need to do that. All you need to do is if you have the money and it's that important to you that you go to a reputable law firm. And then they're the ones who, when they hire somebody, go and say, okay, how did this guy do on the bar exam and so forth. And so they're the intermediary where they're experts ensure that the services you're getting as the final customer are more likely than not to be good ones. And of course, if they do have somebody who's a drunk, he shows up to court and is terrible, and you know he his clients are always losing. Well, he's not going to do very well in the law firm. He's not going to make partner. They're going to get rid of him. And so, over time, the big law firms that are successful are going to have um, attorneys that serve their clients' interests. Um, other examples would be something like a college that, as the if you're sending your your children to a private school, of course you couldn't possibly as the parent be up to speed on, oh, well, what's, you know, the history professors there, are they good? And the mathematicians, they really know what they're talking about. And the biologist, 
that would be crazy. And so the the naive person would think, oh, so we need to have government involvement in picking curricula and setting standards for education because otherwise, you know, these schools would be hoodwinking parents and how could they possibly know? But again, parents are competent enough to know to do enough research to say, well, this school's graduates, they get placed much more than this other schools, and so there must be something to it. And again, it's there. Ultimately, it's the, the businesses that hire graduates from that school. They know what they need to have for success in the marketplace. And so the it's, um, again, just this intermediary function that ultimately, so, so when I want to apply to teach economics somewhere, it's not really the parents of the students that I'm teaching classes to who are determining whether I'm good or not. It's the peers and the other people in the economics department that interview me and I'd give a presentation and they see, does this guy know what he's talking about? And so, and again, it's in their interest to do that. And you, and yes, in principle, they could hire someone who doesn't know economics to teach principles, but why would they do that? It's not in their interest to do so. And then um, same thing with the hospital that people, again, the, the thing that they're really afraid of is when it comes to um, medical practices and the idea, oh, if the government weren't involved, you know, there'd be all these quacks out there doing brain surgery with no degree. But again, the customer's job would not be to become an expert in brain surgery and do a background check. He would just go to a big hospital. And again, they're not going to hire someone who doesn't know what they're doing because that would be bad for business. And it's, um, it is true. We can imagine these nightmare scenarios where if you just go on the internet and go to somebody's website that says, yeah, I'm a great brain surgeon. Come to my place and I'll do it for $50. Why pay big bucks when you can come to me and get it for, for you know $50? That if you're that um, irresponsible to, to believe that sort of thing, well, probably no matter what the government or anyone else tries to do, you're going to be uh, taken in if you're that um, naive. And so the, again, the, what would be required of someone in a free society is nothing more than for things where you're really not an expert and you personally can't distinguish frauds from legitimate um, experts, then get somebody else involved, go through an intermediary. And the last one that I hadn't even thought of until recently, there was an article in the Freeman and then actually on Mises.org, I think, about credit cards and how in modern society, at least capitalist society, that when you buy something on a credit card, there's actually, in a sense, you're, the whole credit card company is on your side. And that if there's a dispute, if you know you buy something over the internet and it doesn't get shipped to you, that you can complain to the credit card company and often they will just remove those charges from you and then they know okay, we've gotten a lot of complaints about this particular website from our customers, so let's you know alert somebody else or let's warn our customers. And so, again, this is another example of intermediaries coming into play. Um, another aspect is, is trade associations. And here, the analysis is a bit tricky because if we're talking about the completely free society, it's not clear wh how whether these things would exist or what, what form they would take. Um, things like guilds and, and trade unions – because, of course, they wouldn't be allowed to, to go on strike and form a picket line and prevent so-called scabs from coming in. And so, But to the extent that there are aso voluntary associations of, of professionals, that those also would be a signaling mechanism. And so, uh, for example, doctors or other sorts of professionals could join this, this voluntary union and then advertise that to customers to say, oh, I'm a member of, you know, the the excellent uh, surgeons of Cincinnati Association, and that those, so th their record would speak for itself, and so people would know, it's true, they wouldn't know the particular track record of any given doctor, but they would know that, yeah, I've never heard a bad thing about anyone in that group, and that if, if he does screw up, then that group always is quick to pay, you know, compensation and to keep, keep their customers happy, and they wouldn't let quacks into their midst, because that wouldn't be good for them, and so that's another um, mechanism by which experts could sort of coalesce and, and signal to the rest of society that we really know what we're talking about as judged by our peers. Mises Institute adjunct scholar. For <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, just the, 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 and then the last um, one that I think most free marketeers would, would, would agree with, and then we'll uh, get into the, the more esoteric mechanisms, I think, in a free society. But the, the second last one would be just these um, organizations that give independent ratings. So thus far, I've mostly talked about why the people providing the goods or the ones who are somehow involved in the chain of delivery have incentives to uh, to provide quality for customers. But we've also got things like Consumer Reports magazines that uh, you know provide 
supposedly objective ratings. And I say supposedly because even there, you know, the, the critic, depending on how hostile you are to a market setting, you could say, oh, well, the big businesses would just pay consumer reports to give, um, you know, biased reports on a particular product. And yeah, in, th- in principle, that could happen. But again, once that sort of thing gets out, then Consumer Reports loses its whole function. And so it's really not in its interest. And so if you do have a huge um, magazine like that or or whatever the, the rating is, um, what is it, the Underwriters Association, if you've bought electrical products and they have on the back the little UA, and that's uh, to, to to signify that this has been inspected by this association and so on, and that it meets our standards of excellence. So, in order to to be to gain that sort of widespread trust, you would have to have a record of objectivity, and that's again something customers can go to. And then another example with the internet, it's it's even easier. Uh, there's this site called ePinions that uh, my wife goes to a lot when she wants to to buy before she buys something online. And uh, recently, she she ran into this cooking club club scam where. There was just to quickly boil down the story. There was this. Um, it was twelve dollars a year, and they would send you um, these recipes and things like that in the mail. And you would just try new products. So they would send you new products that they wanted to write up and use in their recipes. And so that was the, the point of you being a member. Is you'd get this free stuff in the mail. And again, it was twelve dollars a month. And but for some reason, she just before she sent in the money, she went to this e pinions and and typed in the, the name of this club to search for it. And there was all this negative reaction to people go to this site and just post their their opinion on certain products and services. And this one lady told a story of how she joined and tried to sign up for one year, but they made her sign up for two years and they billed her for twenty four dollars. But she said, okay, whatever. And then they sent her this, I forget what it was, thirty dollar book, let's say, of recipes that she didn't order, and then sent her a bill for it. And at that point, she was had had it with these people. And one of their selling points in their initial thing to get you to subscribe is if at any point you're dissatisfied with our service, you know, just let us know and we'll totally refund your money. So at that point she did that. She sent the book back, said, I don't want this. Just cancel me. Give me back my, my membership dues. And they sent her a check apparently, as she tells the story, for whatever the balance was. But before she cashed it, she happened to read the fine print and there was an agreement that if you cash, if you deposit this check in the bank, you are agreeing to a lifetime membership for $300 with our club. And so, I mean, it's just the, you know, the, the nightmare that everyone's worried about. And I, I don't know if that is a, is a legally enforceable thing that they had on there, but that's not the point. The point is my wife was smart enough to go to this e-pinions and check and So, of course, she didn't send them $12 in the first place and um, didn't get sucked into dealing with that disreputable company. And so that's, that's just the point. And, of course, yeah, there's abuses possible, but there are these mechanisms in place to try to minimize it. So then the, the the last issue, and as I said, up till now, these are all things that I think any free marketeer would agree with. The last one now that um, has really only been stressed, to my knowledge, in the anarcho-capitalist literature, the, the, the literature focusing on the, the economics of a completely privatized society, is um, the role of insurance companies. And just to, to show that this isn't completely theoretical, just the other day there was an article in Slate uh, the online Slate magazine talking about insurance in the movie industry and how um, apparently the way it works is if you're going to make a, a major motion picture, in order to get investors to go in and, and put the you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases into the film, that they want to be assured, well, what happens if, if it doesn't actually come to the big screen? Something could happen in the meantime, and they want to have some um, assurance. And so ins- there's an, a type of insurance that says if the film doesn't, get completed and, and go to the theaters, we pay off all the big investors. And, and, and that's, the, that's what the policy is, and it's the premiums are in the you know $7, 8000000 million sometimes, depending on how big the film is. And one of the provisions for this type of insurance, one of the, the critical events that can trigger the insurance payoff is if uh, there's a, a major actor or actress for some reason can't finish the film because that can just kill a project dead in the water. And apparently Nicole Kidman... Um, in two of her projects, I, th- I think it was the same injury with her foot, um, got injured and she couldn't finish the film. And so then when she went to make, I believe it was the movie Cold Mountain, initially they couldn't get an insurer to pick it up because they said, no, we've had problems with her. And if she doesn't finish, you don't want to get $10 million into shooting. And then she you know, messes up her foot again. And so there was an issue there and they had to come up with special circumstances. And then Angelina Jolie in, an, in the uh, action movie that she was um, filming, uh, they were touting it how she was doing all of her special st- stunts on her own, 
But according to this article, the insurance company was the one in there making sure that it was actually as safe as possible given what they wanted the film to look like and that they were doing things like, you know, putting on an extra harness and insisting. So it wasn't it wasn't her agent that was in there working on her behalf. It wasn't Angelina Jolie herself saying, wait, this looks kind of dangerous. It was the insurance company because they stood to lose tens of millions of dollars if she broke her leg and they couldn't finish the film. And so, it, again, it's not altruism. It's just, of course you're going to do that if, it's, if there's millions of dollars on the line. So that's one instance. And then to, um, and the last example I can give you is with the airline industry, and this was what I was alluding to earlier when I wrote that letter to the editor. The, um, you, know, you think, well, without the FAA, how could there possibly be safety in air travel because you know, would consumers have to just monitor the plane crash record of every single airline? And that's, just, that's crazy. These free market apostles are just naive and unrealistic if they think consumers are going to keep that kind of information and big business would cut corners. They wouldn't you know, have a, an adequate maintenance record on their airlines and so forth. And they wouldn't have pilot screening, and they, you know, we'd have drug addicts trying to fly planes around were it not for the FAA. And every time there's a plane crash, people point to that and say, see, that's the free market, and we need to have more government regulation. So, the, so what would the completely free market do in, in response to that? And I think an insurance would be the major mechanism. And so your only responsibility as a potential flyer it would not be to do – I mean you could if you wanted to. If that was your hobby, you could go ahead and, and keep like Rain Man if, if you remember that part of the movie where Dustin Hoffman doesn't want to fly because he knows the complete statistics of air crashes in the last 50 years. You, you could be like that if you wanted to and pick your carrier that way. But all you would really need to do was make sure that whenever you bought a ticket, part of what you were buying was a pledge that if the plane goes down and you're dead as a result, we will pay your estate, whatever it is, a million dollars compensation. And so then, just as with the, the movie industry, there would be these huge liabilities, potential liabilities, the insurers would then make sure before they underwrote a, an airline that it was a safe airline. And they could even have surprise inspections. You know, They could say to the airline, yeah, we will guarantee your um, flights so that if there is a crash, we'll be the ones paying your customers or their estates, not you guys directly. But in return for that, of course, you're going to pay us premiums. And also, if you want to have lower premiums, you have to agree that whenever we want, we can send inspectors over there unannounced and show up. We can go look and look at your you know, maintenance logs, and we can check your, your um, screening processes for how do, you, how do you pick your pilots and things like that. And so, in principle, it's possible they could have drug tests and things like that. We don't, we don't know exactly what would happen, but in principle, as long as it was all voluntarily agreed to before anyone um, worked with the company, that they could do that. So all of these measures that the government allegedly needs to implement in order to rein in uh, unscrupulous airlines could be done by the free market. And, of course, we would have every reason to expect that it would be more efficient in that respect. Um, how would you apply that to a case of uh, something like smoking? Um, now, I, my understanding is that uh, insurers charge a lot more for life insurance for, for smokers. And that, right. that works to some extent to discourage Smoking, so that you're free, perfectly free to smoke. But if you want to be insured, you have to pay a premium. Right, exactly. And it's so there, there's that, and there's also just even um, to get driver's insurance that or car insurance that you know, you've, you've been in more accidents and you have to pay higher premiums. And so, so you're right. There, the effects of insurance in getting people to internalize externalities, to use the the jargon of mainstream economics, is it's all over the place. Any any sort of interaction you've ever had with your own insurance company. Just shows you that, or um, just recently to get, I've just moved to um, Auburn for the summer, and we had to get, we were looking into renters insurance, and the guy asked me, um, he said, "Do you have a fire extinguisher in the building? Do you have a deadbolt?" And I forget what the third one was, but there were three things, and he said, "Oh, you need, you know, if you have those three things, then I can lower your premium for you." And so, you know, right there, there was incentives for me, and it, depending, it turned out we did have a fire extinguisher. Oh, a smoke alarm was the other one, and so right there, of course, in order to get. The, whatever the rate reduction was, I would have gone out even though I'm renting and bought a fire extinguisher if it meant that I was going to have that lower premium. So, so yes, the, the, the very naive person would have thought, oh, the government clearly has to pass a law requiring buildings of a certain size to have so many fire extinguishers per square footage. But no, I mean the insurance company, if it's going to pay when the place burns down, it's in their interest as well. So yeah, I, I agree with you that all those aspects – um, I, I don't know if you want to get into this just now, but 
Um, let's say that uh, uh, you make the case that in 99% of the time, uh, the market is capable of providing this consumer protection in a way in which uh, is satisfactory for, for everybody. Um, what you haven't addressed is the potential, the costs of, of regulation. What if somebody says, yeah, all that's true, but it's fine just to have, nonetheless, a kind of a legal apparatus, mm -hmm. just in case. Right. Yes. What's uh, the downside of that? Okay, yeah, that's, let me, uh, I'll try to be a little bit um, systematic in how I, I go through that. So you're, you're right. All we, I've really talked about thus far is what mechanisms are there so that the market wouldn't be completely helpless in the face of dangers posed to consumers. But you're right. It's, I think the, um, the common attitude is, okay, sure, the market could do some things, but it's not going to hurt to have the government help. And so why, why don't we have the government do all this stuff? And then you know, on the margin, if the market wants to fill in the gaps, that's great. And there's, there's several objections we could raise. And again, I'll try to start with some of the, the more obvious ones that I think most people would agree with. And then as we get on, I'll get into some more refined ones that maybe only Austrians would really understand. Um, so the thing Milton Friedman points out, I think it was in Free to Choose, is that the, if you just look at the incentives facing, for example, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, they're, they actually have the incentive to be very conservative in what products they allow on the market. And so if there's a new drug that has the potential to, just to exaggerate, to, to cure a certain type of cancer, for example, but the downside is you know, every thousand, per, thousand person, um, excuse me, every thousand people who use it, one of them is going to die from you know, some side effect, that the FDA might not approve it. Because, of course, what's going to happen is if they do approve it and too many people die because of this drug, they're going to take the heat for it that, oh, why did you approve that unsafe product? Whereas if they don't approve it and keep it off the market, 999 people are dying from cancer who otherwise would have been cured, but that's not the FDA's fault. Oh, cancer killed them. And so the incentives facing the FDA in terms of avoiding political heat, that they don't really – it's not as if the people who benefit from a new drug pay some of – pay some compensation to the FDA and say, thank you for allowing me to use it. The FDA actually doesn't benefit except in the sense of, you know, feeling good for helping someone live, but they certainly do lose if they approve an unsafe product. And so there's the incentives facing the FDA. It's, it's their um, keep things off the market that, and we see that all the time with arguments about why are certain drugs allowed in Europe, but they're not allowed here. And people complain about that. Um, another, I think in this, perhaps directly answers your question, what's the harm of the government at least doing what it can, is that it gives a false sense of security to the population. That, in other words, given that there is this regulatory framework in place where the government is allegedly ensuring your safety, then consumers, their guard is down and they don't bother being as vigilant as they would be if they really thought it's up to me to be sure that what I'm buying for my family is safe. Um, just... An, one example would be um, the value jet situation, and that's part of what, what prompted me to write my original um, letter to the editor when I was a, a teenager on that, is that the person in that article um, in the op-ed piece who was complaining about the value jet crash in the Everglades and sarcastically saying, you know, the libertarians think that the market's capable of doing it, but we all want the government working overtime with their inspectors. Uh, she had an offhand remark about how the um, – the only reason customers are continuing to fly value jet is because the government is there, you know, ensuring that now its its operations are safe. You know, the government's on the job, and we went in there, and now value jet's got its house in order. And so it was the the writer didn't realize the irony of of saying that you know here's this company that was obviously in her mind unsafe, and the plane crashed when apparently you know it didn't need to, and that she was saying. Instead of saying, look, it, the government was in charge from before this plane crash happened, it still is in charge. The government assures us, oh, the reason we're involved with the airline industry is to keep it safe and not in the dangers of the free market. There's a plane crash. And rather than saying, huh, the government's doing a bad job, she was saying, yep, see, the, the government is doing a great job. That's the market causing the crash. And you free marketeers are so silly for not realizing it's the government that encourages people to fly value jet in the first place, And whereas that's an argument against it. Um, another example would be um, – I remember there was an amusement park ride that had to be shut down temporarily. It, one of the I don't remember which one it was Six Flags or one of those big amusement parks because uh, I don't know if there was a death or not. But so I think yeah I think there was I think a kid fell off the I think it was a Ferris wheel or something like that and, and somebody fell off and so they they shut it down and they the, the inspectors come in and check it out and it was funny that there were there were lines is the day it reopened 
by which that meant the government finally said, okay, yep, this is now safe. There were huge lines of people waiting to pile onto this thing. And of course, none of those people went in and checked the safety log and said, okay, I see how by that kid two weeks ago died, but now I'm convinced. No, the government checked it out. It's okay. And so there's this idea that, or you know, if you're walking down the street in a big city and there's a hot dog vendor, I think a lot of people have the idea that, well, gee, it, it smells bad and it doesn't look like this guy's washing his hands, but come on, the government wouldn't let him sell those to us if they were really dangerous. And so I think that people um, just – they're not as vigilant in, in looking out for their own welfare because they think that, oh, the government's there to protect us. Why don't you say the same thing about insurance companies, though? Couldn't you, couldn't yeah, you say? Uh, yeah, in the sense that uh, the insurance companies are there protecting mm -hmm. people, so wouldn't that also make consumers? Yeah. There would, so what's the difference? Okay, the difference would be, so yeah, that's a, that's a good possible objection someone could raise. Um, the difference would be, first of all, that I don't think there's this widespread but erroneous view that insurance companies are your friend and you know they're there to help you where you know, people have this, this distrust of insurance companies and so and and not even if you don't have that that bias against them just that for whatever reason people understand when things are done between private individuals that okay they have their interests we have ours and we're going to have a voluntary agreement and we both benefit and just realizing that they're not there to help me, but they're you know benefiting themselves. And let's just make sure it's all voluntary and, and and it's mutually beneficial. And even beyond that, just the fact that if there is an insurance company, it doesn't have a monopoly, and so if it is failing to to pay out its legitimate claims, it'll eventually go out of business. Whereas if the government isn't doing a good job promoting airline safety, it's not that all oh, the FAA is going to go out of business. So there, so that's the the psychological reason. Is for, for what it's worth, but then the more important um, sort of market check. Another uh, example, and again, I don't know in the grand scheme how important this is, but it's just something I noticed, is I think some of these government measures, although they sound good in the abstract, they I think they really have a counterproductive effect. And so what I have in mind is I don't know when it when it happened, but within the last, let's say, five years, I noticed these products on television – There'd be these ads um, for Claritin or whatever, and then at the end they would have these disclaimers. I'm sure you've heard them that you know the, the announcer's voice changes and he says things like, you know, "Use of this product may encourage uh, drowsiness, nausea, explosive diarrhea." Da, 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 da. And <laughs> and and I remember the first time I heard a commercial, I was stunned, and I actually thought, you know, who would possibly, you know, it must be because of some silly government regulation forcing them to give these disclaimers. And so and so I thought that was dumb. Because of you know just the principle involved that why are you forcing these people you know if, if consumers don't have the the um, you know the foresight to check up on these things or that's their own fault, but 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 I also I was puzzled as to why would you pay to to rent out advertising on television if you were forced to admit at the end that you know this product may cause you to have you know sexual problems or whatever I mean, some of these things that they're forced to say are, are ridiculous, and. And it just shows that I don't understand the way the world works fully because, of course, what happened was within a few months, you had heard so many different products with all these outlandish warnings at the end that people just don't even care anymore. And that, you know, now it's just standard when you hear these allergy medications or heart, whatever the, the medication is that's being advertised, they always have these ridiculous, horrible things at the end that the announcer's voice changes and he says may cause, blah, 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 blah. But nobody cares because it's, oh, yeah, the, the government makes them say that, and it's probably, you know, they injected a thousand times the dose in the lab rat, and it became sterile, but who cares? I mean, the government wouldn't let them sell it if it were really dangerous, right? And so that's – so it, it's it's ironic that because the government and – and again, I don't know the specifics, but I'm sure there must be some regulatory change that why there were all of a sudden this flood of commercials on TV like this, whereas before there weren't. Um, it, it must – the d depending on – of course, we can't be naive that who knows what the actual um, reasons for the legislation were, but assuming people really did think this is going to make products safer and we don't want people to advertise unsafe products, it's had the opposite effect that now people, I think, tune out those warnings altogether because they they hear it so much and it just, you know, it's not as if the, the, the commercial has to give the details of the specific peer-reviewed studies and what actually happened and what was the sample size and how many people got sick. They just give the, you know, may cause... And people just tune that out. So it's it's ironic then that if anyone were concerned about their safety, that I think the fact they have those disclosures, they it gives them the sense. Okay, well look, the government's on the job. They're doing you know they're looking into these companies and they're keeping them honest. And so now I'm going to go buy this product. When if it weren't for that, people 
their natural suspicion. They might do their own research or they might look at consumer reports and, and see what the what the real um, distinguishing features were of the various products. Um, there's a couple other things that economists bring up a lot. For example, um, when you have licensing restrictions, and, and there the idea is you don't want to have quacks going into medicine, and so the government has to get involved. You have the AMA to restrict services to those who are truly qualified, that the way in practice it turns out with, and it's not surprising given the nature of, of government, is that it ends up being a measure, a, a measure to just restrict the number of practitioners so they can raise their salaries, and so that there's um, you know, all sorts of ridiculous qualifications, hurdles you need to jump over in order to get the license from the state in order to practice this. And the, the silliest one, there was, um, and so I forget the state, but there was some state where they had, in order to become a florist, you needed a certain, you needed to pass this licensing exam, and you had to do things like arrange flowers in certain ways, and on the test you had to study for techniques that apparently were no longer used, just consumer demand had changed, and it was just some obsolete, when the test was designed, it was a, a floral arrangement that people purchased, but 50 years had gone by, and nobody ever wanted that sort of arrangement anymore, but yet it was still on the test. And of course, the reason was that it was weeding out potential competitors. And, so the, and of course, the people who p have the largest input to the state to design these licensing tests and requirements are the current practitioners. I mean, it, and it stands to reason, who else would the state turn to to say, what does someone need to do to receive a license to be a brain surgeon? Well, you'd ask the current brain surgeons. Who else are you going to ask? But, of course, they're the ones who have every reason to restrict the number of future brain surgeons because they're their direct competitors. So it's it's a cynical view, of course, but I, I think anyone who's who's seen this in practice knows that it, it does happen. And, and it may even be largely subconscious, and maybe most of the people putting the input in for these um, licensing exams and so forth think that they're – acting in the public interest, but of course there's um, all sorts of arbitrary and, and uh, non-essential hurdles for people to jump over. So you might say in this case, consumer protection becomes a, a form of a producer protection. Right, exactly. And it uh, certainly raises, and, and the same thing too with um, you know licensing for accreditation programs for schools and what does a school need to do in order to convince the government that it's really churning out well-educated individuals that if you if you see that what you need to actually do to get the approval often cases it's it's not something directly tied to the um, how much knowledge you've imparted to your customers um, and then so we we can sort of break up the the objections against the government into I've talked mostly about the incentive problem that there's monopoly and that the government you know a public choice analysis, if you will, that why would the government do things to act in the common welfare if, given that they're human beings and they're and and in fact people who go into the government service or government um, rule in order to to lord it over subjects, that why do we? There's this this idea that people who go into government are there; they do that to, to selflessly serve others. Whereas the public choice school has been big on analyzing government actions assuming the politicians are just like other actors in the marketplace and that given that it's it's easy to see why these things would be suboptimal from a, a narrow efficiency viewpoint. And then there's also what you might call the Hayekian knowledge problem that, okay, let's just assume that the people in the FDA and the FAA, they really are uh, out to help consumers and they really do want to do the best thing. Again, there's this knowledge problem that Hayek is, is linked to and that um, – how is the government, the, the people actually setting the rules, how are they going to get all of the dispersed knowledge that, how do they know, for example, just to give you an example of the trade-off, that when it comes to those safety caps, those child-resistant safety caps, one of the biggest problems with them, apparently, is that elderly people can't open their medication because those those caps, you know, if you have arthritis, you can't get those caps off. And so what they do is they just keep all the caps off in their medicine cabinet or they dump them out into different containers, but that defeats part of the purpose of you know, keeping things in the in the container and knowing how much to take, and the, if you have it in an unlabeled container, they might forget. Oh, did I take that? You know, or what was this for? And they might get their pills mixed up. And so again, it's just this example of the counterproductive aspects of the regulation. And so there, again, it's not you don't need to be cynical and assume that the politicians are trying to hurt elderly people, even if they really were trying to help them. If they didn't foresee that particular example, you know, they didn't 
they weren't thinking of elderly people with arthritis in their fingers when they designed. They were thinking of, oh, I want to prevent little four-year-old Tommy from getting into his, his dad's medication. And so that's what I you could call the Hayekian problem of when the government sets up a monopoly and has a one-size-fits-all approach that all the little feedback from different people who see various aspects of the problem and have insight that can't possibly in the real world be communicated into the people setting policy. Airbags come to mind in that case. Here's a case where they're an attempt to protect adults right. back for exactly. children. Exactly. And then you have the issue of, you know, people, are they legally allowed to disable the airbag? And it's it's just uh, a nightmare in terms of that. And then, but I think more fundamentally, and this would is something that the Austrian school is, um, I wouldn't say has a monopoly on, but I think that they're the ones who have had the most insight into this, is what's called the, the calculation problem that goes back to Ludwig von Mises' arguments against socialism. And so this takes it even one step further. So we'll give them the incentives. We'll just assume that the... Um, the people setting the policy are benevolent and they want to help consumers and they're not just out for you know for winning elections. Okay, so we can concede that. We can even concede the hacking and knowledge problem and assume the planners have all the relevant technical information that they know that okay, if we um you know make the child cap a little bit harder to get off then this many old people are gonna be affected and if we make it a little easier then this many toddlers are gonna now be able to pry those things off and they have all sorts of the medical and technological information, even so, there's a calculation problem that's still not enough to know what's the so-called correct thing to do, what's the correct regulation. Um, just to give you some examples, if it comes to the roads, that in a sense a road can be viewed as a consumer good, and at least insofar as you are just a motorist and that's the final good for you. And so how do, how do we know how many stop signs to put, or, or should there be a stop sign at a given intersection, or you know, should it be um, a three-way stop or a four-way stop, or maybe there should be a yield sign, or what should the speed limit be? Should there be a traffic light? I mean, all these things are economic in the sense they take real resources. Someone has to make that decision. Um, should the road, you know, this road freezes a lot in the winter. Maybe we should have more um, or more salt being laid down, or, or maybe we should just, you know, redesign, put up guardrails or whatever. There's all sorts of, or put, put a new sign here to warn people that there's a steep curve ahead. So there's, there's all sorts of uh, th decisions that the bureaucrats have to make when it comes to road management that have definite effects on on safety. I remember I, I was a uh, a low level grunt when I just graduated in a, in a in an engineering firm in Chicago, and that was part of what they worked on were, were um, roads, and, and that was one of the things they did. And they would go and look and rank intersections in terms of fatalities. And then you know if there was one where gee, a lot of people have been dying on this place, they'd look at it and say, what can we do? Okay, so it, they do have measures, but the point is. That alone is not enough. You might think, oh, well, it's it's the intersection that has the most fatalities. They clearly need to have a stop sign there or something like that, but maybe not. Maybe that would cause so many people, if it's a really busy intersection, maybe that would cause so many people to be late to work, you know, just the slow commute times, or maybe um, that people knowing that, oh, they just put a stop sign there, let's go to this other place, you know, in terms of change our route to work, and maybe then there'd be even more fatalities because maybe originally people were using the safe road in terms of its conditions, but now because of that stop sign there that the government thinks it's trying to help us, well, now I'm going to you know get to work a different way where it's really uh, dangerous. So there's all these things that that need to come into play, and, and the point is there's no way the government, even if we can see that they had all that information, even if we can see they really did want to help people, there's all these trade-offs involved, and there's no way to know what's the correct answer, whereas if it were all privatized, then you would at least have the uh, market test of profit and loss, and that there would be some criterion of success. It wouldn't be perfect, as Mises himself concedes. It's not that the monetary test of profit and loss is the end of the story and that there aren't other values to be weighed against it, but at least you would have some benchmark to reduce all of these different um, values to some common denominator. And so it would be the same thing um, with, with safety in general, that if you had, um, j just to give you an, a different example, r right now when the government... Uh, one of the major forms or manifestations of consumer protection is the amount of fines that, that people have to pay if they harm consumers so that if a company is convicted of selling an adulterated product, what do they do? They they have to pay fines to the government and also generally huge compensations to the aggrieved party. But the level of the fine, that's something the government determines. And so it, it's, it's certainly not an objective fact of medicine uh, you know how much should a company be charged or be fined if if 
one out of every thousand people that goes to their restaurant dies of food poisoning that you don't know. And that's, that's again, that's not a number that just drops out of the analysis. You, that, that's an economic question. And maybe in a third world country, their standards would have to be lower that they couldn't insist that every employee has, um, you know, proper gloves and that the the grill is cleaned methodically every every six hours and things like that. Maybe that if they did that, the, the place wouldn't be able to operate profitably. And then maybe people would go to the to the river to to drink water and they would get sick that way or something. So it's these questions are related to economics. It's not merely a matter of oh what do, what do the doctors say or, or what do the health experts say. And so that's why you need it to be intertwined in a, in a private property framework, or else there's no way to come up with an objective answer to these things. Uh, well, the, the point the point is that uh, that uh, uh, regulators would tend to concentrate on engineering questions and uh, on on certain absolutes: is it safe? Is it not? Right. Whereas uh, in the market, uh, uh, you, you uh, are always considering trade offs, mm -hmm. relative benefits. Right. Exactly. And there's, it just occurs to me that it, we, I'm, I'm focusing on these these real uh, particular areas just to sort of show how the economic theory relates to it. But in the real world, if you just step back and look, think about it, in what sense, it's just crazy to think that the government is providing safety that in terms of the product of education, for example, if you go to government schools, you might get shot. All right? So it's not a matter of, you know, it, it's absurd, in other words, to be focusing on, oh, well, the government has to have measures in place so that if, if a company has some water out, on the hallway and someone slips and breaks his leg that the company's liable. Okay, well what if the government has schools set up where most you know, there's a there's a decent chance that someone's gonna get shot by a, a fellow classmate. And that that's you know, that just seems like, oh well that's not the government's responsibility or that's not their fuss because the you know the kids aren't but but again, I mean that's to the extent that that one thinks as I do, and I'm sure many people do, that that wouldn't happen nearly as much if education were in the private sector and particularly if People weren't forced to go to school who didn't want to be going to school in the first place. I don't think there'd be nearly as many school shootings or you know bullying in general. So in that trivial sense, that oh, of course education would be safer in terms of the you know the good being provided to consumers if the government didn't get involved or um, just uh, you know the, the drug war and, and the way that that causes you know going to your local market in the inner city could be hazardous to your health. You know so there's. So we can certainly argue, and I think it's true, just thinking of consumer protection laws per se, why they make things less safe. But in terms of why is the world such a dangerous place in the first place, you know, if you're if you're in Iraq, one of the dangers is you might get hit by a U.S. cruise missile. All right, so the the idea that that the government is out there to make the world safe, I think, just on the face of it, if you consider the government in its totality, is is not nearly as, as obvious as it is to some people. Yeah, and the, and the presumption, too, that, that somehow um, the government is the best institution for assuring our, uh, our to, for protecting our interests. We, mm -hmm. we might then look at uh, the consumers of government services as, in general, better off than the consumers of, of private services. But mm -hmm. that's just manifestly untrue. Right, and I, I don't know. It, it's just this attitude. I guess I'm used to it, and I, but just to point it out, that, again, whenever – something bad happens, oh, that's because that's human nature or that's the market. And then when the government needs to take measures, just this um, this example, I brought along this excerpt from uh, Paulina Berserk who had that, that book, Cyber Selfish. Now, this this excerpt, I think, came in a column she wrote after that. And so she's she was going on a tirade about, you know, these, these moronic libertarians. And so she says here, I will instead mention a recent nasty epidemic of food poisoning that just erupted at a Mexican restaurant in San Mateo County. Turns out the restaurant hadn't been inspected in more than a year because, surprise, it turns out budget cuts made it impossible to hire enough health inspectors. But hey, government is the great Satan, and we all believe in self-regulation, and who needs taxes? Okay, so she's, you know, she's, she's being very sarcastic there, and, and she's pointing out this example of a Mexican restaurant that there was food poisoning because the, you know, the government had to cut its budget. And so in her mind, this just shows you these, these moronic libertarians, they want to cut taxes and leave it to the market. But there's an example you know, where it failed. But again, the government never said to anybody, we're going to take over um, regulating food and don't worry, in 20 years we'll finally ensure safety, but just give us some time. No, the government says right now, we, you are safe because of us. And yet here's an example of where the government obviously failed. And so it's – again, it's, it happened with September 11th. Nobody – well, very few people said – 
oh, yep, see, that's what happens when the government provides safety for you, that you know, the planes get hijacked. No, everyone said, oh, we need to have the government step in and nationalize um, the the searching process. So it's I, – I, I, don't, I don't know why that is, but I can just point out the fact that for whatever reason, whenever anything bad happens, it's the fault of the market, even if it was something that was totally regulated by the government initially. Yeah, actually, let me mention something that strikes me as ironic. In all the work of Mises, you get again and again this constant focus on uh, the great merit of capitalism is that it serves the consumer. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is his continuing theme. I mean, it seemed like in, in his own mind, this was a decisive argument for the market. Mm -hmm. How did it come to be that we associate consumer welfare, consumer interests, consumer protection mm -hmm. with the public sector? I... I don't know enough to, to give a definitive answer. I imagine part of the – or the, perhaps the main thrust occurred during the progressive era, and I, I don't know the specific dates of various government regulations, but I'm sure a lot of the, um, you know, the foundation of what we now look at as the government's mechanisms for consumer protection probably originated back then. And I, it's I, – I think part of it is – at least from interacting with members of my family who are certainly inclined towards government um, paternalism, I, th I think some of it at least is that they're very suspicious of of people in general, and so they they rightly when someone you know a laissez faire economist extols the virtue of capitalism, the free market, they're very suspicious and they think no no I've dealt with credit card companies and I've dealt with insurance companies and I know those guys are shady and you know you shouldn't trust them. And, and that in and of itself is fine, and I think that's that's good, and you should be. You know, I've I've had bad dealings with some credit card companies as well, and I just try to not do business with them again. But for whatever reason, then they just leave themselves wide open to, and therefore, let's turn to the government to protect us from these people. And so it's I I, I don't know why it's just I guess an inconsistency or failure to apply their cynicism across the board, where a lot of people just they they perhaps they had a bad dealing with a particular business, and it just sours them, but they don't realize. That yes, it is possible. No one, at least no responsible advocate of the free market, is ever going to maintain it's impossible for there to be an unscrupulous business person. But there's mechanisms in place to limit that person and to eventually drive them out of business. Whereas with the government, there's yeah, you could try to vote them out of office, but I don't think any politician ever got voted out because of some regulatory practice of the FDA under his administration. That that was never anything that the election was going to turn on, and so it's. It's just there's really no way by which citizens can ensure their safety working through the government. You've uh, given a great uh, theoretical apparatus and many practical examples for un understanding the uh, consumer protection through the market and uh, consumer protection through the pu public sector. And yet still uh, you will have people that will respond to everything you've said mm -hmm. uh, with, with uh, a line, something like a private enterprise um, just has a tendency to put profits before people. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's there's two ways to answer that. So the one way is just to take it head on and say, yeah, it, it will, but it just so happens that in a free market, the way you earn profits is by catering to your customers and that this alleged dichotomy between, well, on the one hand, I want to earn profits, but on the other hand, you know, I may have qualms about killing my customers. Well, no, they're in practice – that's not going to come up. You're never going to have to make that choice, at least as a as a business person who's catering to a, you know a wide um, market. As I said, of course, if you have some real shady scheme and you're just trying to bilk a, a few people out of somewhere and skip town, then maybe you can come up with scenarios where it would be in your interest to skimp on costs and safety and try to get out of out of town before people catch on. But that's not really going to characterize a, a large fraction of what would happen in everyday commercial transactions and precisely because it's not a very profitable living to be doing that. That it's, If you really want to make money, what you do is you set up a big factory and you establish a customer base. And then the other uh, response to that, again, is just to say, oh, it's true. What that's pointing out is there are um, people who would rather earn money than – you know, look out for their well-being of their fellow man, or to put it another way, if they had the choice between having an extra thousand dollars and and doing something that might prevent someone from from getting sick or injured, that a lot of people would just take the money. And that's true. But by the same token, there are plenty of people who would do something that would allow them to win an election 
for to you know gain favor with their superior in government, even if it meant putting people's lives at risk. And so it's again, it's it's not a it doesn't clinch the argument just to say no, no, there are unscrupulous people out there who would put profits above safety. By the by the same token, there would be people out there who would put political power above safety. And so the question is, which mechanism do we think is going to um, limit those people and and sort of eject them from positions of influence in the first place. I have uh, one one final question, unless you have uh, some other things. Um, it relates to fraud. Now, most market economists uh, say that uh, uh, you know fraud is not part of the market, mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 but and, and yet uh, there do seem to be uh, there's it can get ambiguous what constitutes fraud or not, mm -hmm. right? Like for example, ingredients in food packages, right? Right. Yeah. So. So it's true, for example, Rothbard in Man, Economy, and State, the first 11 chapters he devotes to an analysis of the pure, unhampered market economy, and then only in Chapter 12 does he get into the economics of violent intervention. And there, and he, I, I like the way he explains that, motivates it. He says, look, it's not that we're assuming, as many people allege, that the market doesn't have violence in it. The, the real world market that's just it is a definition that first of all let's understand the way the pure market works and then once you learn those mechanisms then it's easier to look at the real world where there are unscrupulous individuals who have no problem initiating aggression when they think they can get away with it in order to understand the effects in that situation you raise an interesting point about fraud because I've, I've often wondered that just in terms of applying um, libertarian or, or Austrian economics to certain issues because some of the definitions of fraud I think people need to to be careful about, for example, uh, something like a fortune teller. You know, the, from a certain point of view, the, the, what the person is claiming that's false advertising. You know, that that's clearly they're not reading the future, or or at least in my metaphysical view, they're not reading the future according to my view of the world. But I wouldn't want the police to go bust in and and arrest these people who are trying to read people's palms. Because I think there's this this idea that well the people involved they they kind of at some level know what they're doing and and in any event um, you know we we just let the let those things proceed so you're, you're right I don't know that they're all I'm trying to say is you have to be de very careful with your definition of fraud and I'm not sure that you can just from first principles spin out an entire theory of it because there's all these little borderline cases where it's really not clear and so I think again a lot of this stuff it's we can certainly argue on the on the margins about piecemeal reform and that wouldn't it be better if the government just got rid of the FAA and let the airline industry be self-regulated or regulated by insurance companies, if you want to use that terminology. But I think ultimately you would have to just have a complete private legal system where these penalties and you know what what's the penalty for killing a customer and that, where that's set not by government um, edict but rather by the competing um, agencies in a, in a private legal setting. So, so yeah, it, and, the, and the same thing with fraud, that what would be the definition of fraud? I'm certainly not a legal expert, and no individual, I think, could spin out an entire theory of it that you would need to have competing scholars offering legal tracks in a private contractual legal framework, and that would, what we mean by fraud in certain cases would just arise through tradition and through precedent with private arbitrators deciding in specific cases, and I don't think there would be a simple list of necessary and sufficient conditions of what constitutes fraud. Just to give a quick final example of that, the whole hysteria about peanut uh, dust in food, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, which apparently appears in strange places you don't expect. Right. And uh, is it is it uh, is it fraud to not disclose the fact that there may there's a tiny tiny chance there's just <laughs> peanut dust in 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 this uh, bag of, of uh, corn chips, you know? Right. Yeah. Because the language now right. it says things like. This this product was made on equipment that has been used to produce peanuts yeah. or something. So it's yeah. not even that your food has peanuts in it, but it was used, touched by equipment. So yeah, yeah. it's I mean, yeah. At some point, you could just push that stuff back indefinitely, and everything's got peanut dust on it. So yeah, it's so it's who you know. What, that's the whole point. It it strikes us as absurd, and clearly there are examples where we can just objectively, if you will, say yeah, that's crazy. And in a in a normal society, that kind of thing wouldn't happen. But then if you say, okay, Jeff or Bob, where should the line be drawn? We can't say, and I don't think anybody can say, and that's why you need to just have it out to um, competitive judicial rulings in a, in a free market setting. What is your reading you pick for this lecture? Um, I think I'm going to assign the 
uh, first half of the chaos theory book because that's where I'm getting into the insurance companies and their interactions. I might also look to see what Rothbard says in Four New Liberty, though. I haven't looked at, at refresh my memory of that, but I'm sure he's got good stuff there. The definitive account, the Austrian account of consumer consumer uh, protection, is yet to be. Oh, written. R- right. I don't think anybody okay. has set out to to okay. do that topic okay. in and of itself. Well, you've got your your next job. <laughs> thanks. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me.